Hello, everybody. And uh, I guess I'll just take it from here. I want to thank the uh, everyone who organized this to bring me on here. This is kind of a nice little thing to do. I'm speaking to you out of my own house in my bedroom. I'm not going to tilt the camera around. We don't need to do that. My bed's partially made. That's all you're going to know. Uh, I'm here to talk about the uh, global dimensions of uh, the UFO phenomenon, uh, however I title it, ET phenomenon. And it, by the way, I'm seeing everyone's chat messages come up. So if you do have an interesting question, uh, you want to chat it in there, and I'll, I'll see it. I should be able to see it. Uh, I'm going to move this over to the side, but I'll still be able to see that. Um, and I'll do my best at answering it if it's kind of in line with things. And I'm seeing all these nice uh, messages, so that's good to see. I appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> I've been researching UFOs a long time, I guess about 20, a little more than 20 years. And my main focus is really not so much on the spiritual aspects of this phenomenon. I think that's interesting. I don't discount it. But I'm really a political analyst. That's fundamentally what I'm interested in doing and looking into. And in terms of the UFO phenomenon, uh, my interest in general and tonight is really to look at <clears throat> to see how this phenomenon relates to us globally and in terms of the international power structure. Uh, in other words, you know, have you asked yourself, how does the cover up operate? Uh, to what extent can we make sense out of this? I don't have every single answer for that, by the way, but uh, I'm going to offer some thoughts about that for you tonight. Someone asked me, do I think the ETs have their own religion? That wasn't really on my agenda, and I have no way of knowing. I mean, what do we even mean by religion? Do they have their own spiritual beliefs? They, my guess is that they have their own spiritual orientation in the sense that they understand um, the nature of their own non-locality. And if they're able to do that, then they have a discipline, and we can call that a religion. I doubt that it's a religion of received wisdom in the sense that we have religion in, from uh, Muhammad or Buddha or, or Jesus or anything like that, uh, you know, a received uh, Bible. I, I would be shocked if ETs had anything along those lines. I think I'm going to probably not answer too many questions here because they're going to take me far off. But here's another one. How do those nations with space programs keep under wrap the artifacts found on other planets? Okay. I'm going to come, I hopefully we will come to that. I'm going to move some of these chats a little off to the side. I think they're going to distract me. Sorry, guys. I'll be able to uh, handle this probably after I'm done with this. How about that? When I look at the uh, UFO phenomenon, when we look at the UFO phenomenon, uh, I think it's very easy to forget that sightings are not only global, they're not only worldwide, <clears throat> but there are so many thousands of encounters that is, direct encounters with what appear to be non-human beings. And on top of that, the thousands upon thousands of uh, perplexing UFO sightings that exist every year. We have no way of knowing how many there are because, frankly, we are at a loss of collecting the data. It's only in North America that we have a couple of websites. There's the MUFON website. There's the National UFO Reporting Center. They collect sites. For 2014, they collected a, a total of, I think, about 14,000 reports last year. 14,000. I'm not saying all of those are alien craft or even that most of them are, but I think uh, they're quite quite interesting. And then when you consider that for every report that there is, there's probably 10 or more that are not reported. It's off the charts. And it's not simply in North America. It is everywhere. Uh, the fact is, in other countries, they do not have websites. They don't really have an organized, systematic way to record this. So I mean, really, when you think about how massive this phenomenon is and how much of a pittance our global effort to collect data is, it's, it's unbelievable. I mean, I just find that astonishing. But what, what we do know is that this phenomenon has engaged highest levels of American national security since at least the 1940s. It's totally possible that it was even before that, but I think uh, from the early 1940s onward, this has been a thing. And I think it's also been a thing to other nations since around roughly the same time. I'm not going to go over the whole litany of airspace violations that existed that we know about that happened in the 40s and 50s, but there were many. 
and we know about them through declassified documents through the Freedom of Information Act. And just to give you like an, a feel for what I'm talking about, I mean, just put yourself back in the position of uh, these top generals, these top intelligence officers responsible uh, for United States national security, okay? So you've just completed the Second World War, and which was an absolutely titanic struggle, uh, which left millions of people homeless and millions on the brink of starvation, which left you with the beginnings of this thing called the Cold War and this rivalry with the Soviet Union, Russia, and, um, and with the advent of a new weapon, an atomic bomb, which, which scared the hell out of the world in the sense that there is this weapon now that people realize could destroy human civilization. This is a very, very big thing. So all of this was hanging over them. And on top of that, there is the appearance of these, let's call them objects, these things that were sighted many times at sensitive uh, installations, nuclear installations primarily over at Los Alamos um, in New Mexico, over at Oak Ridge in uh, Tennessee, over at uh, Hanford, Washington. All of these were critically important nuclear technology installations at the time. Very important and um, each one of them had reports, had instances of objects being sighted. In the case of uh, the Hanford Atomic Energy Commission plant back in 1950, there was a report saying uh, objects round in form have been sighted over the plant. These objects reportedly were uh, over 15,000 feet in altitude. Air Force jets attempted interception with negative results. So the Air Force tried to go after these things. And then the memo went on to say that they alerted anti-aircraft battalion, radar units, Air Force fighter squadrons, and the FBI, all for further investigation of just this one incident. All right. Uh, keeping in mind that every incident we know about through freedom of information, there is very strong reason to believe that there are dozens and hundreds and more incidents that we will probably never know about. So, in other words, airspace violations alone were a very huge thing. And this went on for years and years. And it wasn't simply an American thing. Uh, it became very clear that militaries around the world, and I'll get to civilians in a minute, but militaries around the world were encountering these as well. By the 1970s, we have very good reports out of China. We have very good reports, um, many from the 1950s onward out of South America, quite a few military ones. Uh, there was one from Chile in 1978 that is mind-blowing, uh, where you have multiple encounters by Chilean F-5 aircraft with an enormous aerial object, which that was on multiple radar returns and gave the return of 10 aircraft carriers, except that this wasn't floating on the water. This was up in the sky. Again, visualize something that could be that large. The pilots each had visuals of this object, and they described it as absolutely gargantuan, and they were, they were afraid to approach it. Uh, and as they were getting a little bit closer to it, according to the radar and their eyes, the object just instantly took off to the um, west over the Pacific Ocean and was gone, just gone. So it was not only as large as 10 aircraft carriers, but it had instant acceleration and departure. That's back in 1978. And we have this, this is in a US declassified document um, that we got uh, through Chile. So it's just fascinating. And you have to ask yourself, what, what could that possibly be? Could that possibly be human technology? I think that's very unlikely. Could it possibly be alien? Well, sure. What are they doing in an object that is the size of 10 aircraft carriers? Is that a floating city? That's sure what it seems like to me. And we've had these encounters around the world all through the years. There was a famous case in the United Kingdom in 1980 in England at the Rendlesham Forest, it's very well known of a landed craft. In Russia, in the 1980s, a case in a city called Down the Gorse, where an object came down and seems to have been recovered by the Russians. Massive uh, event in Brazil in 1986. And then again in Russia in 1989 at their place called Kapustin Yar, 
which was like their top uh, missile launch facility. An object came in late at night, hovered low over their nuclear weapons, over their missiles, attempted interceptions, all failed. This object was off the charts in maneuverability. The Russian jets had no capability. And we learned about this after um, uh, in Glasnost when KGB files briefly were opened up relating to UFOs when the Soviet Union broke apart. And that's how we know about this case. Um, another fascinating case a year later in Moscow. Then in Belgium, the famous Belgian Triangle of 1989-1990. And right on through the years and into our own century, we have a famous attempted interception uh, over near Washington, D.C. in 2002. A couple of F-16s completely outclassed. I personally spoke to two of those witnesses. And um, perhaps even more famously in 2008 in Stephenville, Texas, an enormous object seen by witnesses. One of them described it as as big as a Walmart. Flying Walmarts are probably the most frightening thing that I personally can imagine. But the point is that this object had instant acceleration as well. We're talking about things that are just off the charts. I came across a case a few years ago, uh, a Canadian case, the northernmost installation uh, habitation of humans on the planet Earth is at a Canadian military base, very close to the North Pole. It's an electronic listening station, and um, only about 50 personnel are there year-round. And an object there was, uh, was seen hovering low over the base. It uh, appeared to be able to turn off... Uh, uh, excuse me, it turned on a, a spotlight, an intense spotlight beam over the base and then flew off over the frozen Arctic Sea. Um, I spoke at length with one of the witnesses of this case, and I, I think it's a true case. And, um, and it does not appear to either of us that this was any kind of drone technology, any kind of uh, classified military technology. This is really some off the chart stuff. Um, so what I would say on that basis, simply on military encounters, is that our military and other militaries are totally outclassed by technology that comes from elsewhere. Not, there is no evidence that this is ours. Even the, uh, let's call it the Nazi technology thesis, the problem with that thesis is that we have absolutely no clue. If that is true, if, if, if the Germans after World War II developed their own massive infrastructure. We have not the slightest clue where this is, where it's being made, where these objects are being uh, manufactured, uh, and whether they could manufacture an object that's the size of 10 aircraft carriers that has the ability instantly to accelerate back in the 1970s. It's, it's a real stretch. We just don't know what it is. The technology is not officially from our civilization, and it appears to be something radically different from our own. And it appears, indeed, to be technological and physical. Now, it's not simply airspace violations. There's another factor involved in this whole UFO global phenomenon, and that is that there have been, in my view, and that of many other researchers, recoveries of exotic technology and, and bodies. That is, things like Roswell um, and other instances. Roswell is not unique. It is not alone in this matter. Um, and there's really no point for me to go into all of the details here. But uh, I think that the case is very strong that that is so. So let me continue. There are a couple of hypotheses that I keep turning around in my mind as to what is the source of this UFO phenomenon. And I come up with four different possibilities. Um, I don't think of them as equal. I think some are a better possibility than other. But the four that I can think of, one would be like a deep black budget, totally terrestrial explanation um, within the bowels of, let's say, the United States military. They created this. They don't want anyone to know that they've got flying saucer and related technology. That's one possibility. Another possibility is something that's also terrestrial, which I've called a breakaway civilization, which would be like the black budget scenario, except radically advanced and independent of any national authority, and, um, and one in which they've got revolutionary technology that they have developed that they are absolutely not sharing, or at least not anytime soon with the rest of us, 
and they do what they do wherever they do it. Possibility. Third possibility that I've thought of, and this is a more recent idea, but I, I think um, an idea for me, but I think is, is quite possible, is an ancient secret society. So if you go back through, if, if anyone has read, let's say, um, Manly P. Hall's uh, Secret Teachings of the Ages, which I recently read a bit, little over a year ago, fantastic book. One thing he points out is similar in a way to Jim Mars's uh, Rule by Secrecy, except it deals with much more esoteric uh, traditions. And, and what Manley Hall really makes clear in this study of his, which he wrote 100 years ago, was that the ancient religious societies of around the world all had a kind of secret order to them, an esoteric uh, element that was only available to initiates and not available to the great unwashed masses. And uh, that really got me thinking that, you know, this type of any kind of secret esoteric knowledge would be very carefully guarded. And is it possible that we would have had an, a kind of ancient breakaway civilization as a result of that? This is something to keep in mind. And then a fourth possibility, let's call them aliens of some sort. I say of some sort. Are they extraterrestrial aliens? Could be. I don't see why not, frankly. Are they interdimensional entities? We can call them aliens. I don't see why we can't. They're not us, so I think we can say that. Uh, I leave that open. And it's important for me, by the way, in, in my research, not to have a, um, a fast and hard conclusion as to the nature of these beings that we are dealing with. I tend to believe that they are not us. I tend to believe that they are some sort of non-human um, fundamentally, whether that means they're from another dimension of reality or from another planet. But I, I will never pretend that I know for sure what, um, what that answer is. I will say, though, from um, reports, military, and also from now I'm going to get into a lot of um, apparent interactions that people have had with these beings. I myself have spoken at this point probably to hundreds of individuals who've had what appear to be either abduction experiences or encounter experiences or CE5 experiences. And when I look at all of these, all right, um, I see a couple of capabilities of these other beings. One, they have the ability to disable very advanced weaponry that we have. Uh, I didn't get into a lot of those cases, but that is absolutely the case. Two, I think they have the ability to manipulate space-time in some way. We have to remember what is space and what is time. Our common sense tells us space just goes like a river, or uh, rather time just goes like a river and space just goes on and on and on. But that's really not actually what space and time are. Space and time are a fabric, and we know this, um, and we know that uh, space and time have, as it were, their point of origin. Uh, time is not something that just keeps going on and on and on forever. Time is itself able to be manipulated. And it's difficult, I think, for most of us in our common sense to remember that, but I think that is absolutely the case. And I think these other beings seem to have that ability. I also think they have the ability to control our human biology to the extent that they want to. Uh, and I say this because when I think of a number of uh, apparent abduction reports or other encounter reports where people aren't necessarily abducted, but they have an encounter with these in beings, they're often paralyzed. So these beings have the ability to exert total neurological control over, over us if they want to. Another capability of these beings is that they are telepathic. I would say that they are intensely telepathic uh, to the extent that when I... If I were ever to hear a story from a person about their communication with an alien being and it's not telepathic, I think something's wrong with that. Uh, now, there are cases of people having conversations with very bizarre, totally human-looking beings who also happen to be telepathic. So, um, but the telepathic component is... I think very, very significant for these beings. And by the way, I would just add that I think that this is one of their points of interest in us. Uh, 
I think, you know, every human being has got capability in this area. Most of us never really explore it, but I think it's there for everyone. And some people, I think, are particularly talented with, um, with clairvoyance and what we would call psychic phenomenon. And my sense, my guess, is that these beings have a special interest in those people. I mean, think of it this way. If you're looking over these advanced monkeys scurrying about planet Earth, and, um, and you see a few of them, you can tell, have very strong telepathic capabilities because that's just how you work, You'd, you might find an interest in them. That's my thought. Another thing that they're able to do, it seems to me, and this is, I think, a given for them, is memory management or memory control. Um, I do think that some of them walk among us, uh, which would really complicate things when we're talking about the cover-up aspect of it. Because everything that I'm telling you here, I'm going to take a wild guess that this is what the higher level intelligence agencies already know and are very familiar with. So if we play a little game here and assume that we're in such an intelligence agency and we're trying to deal with the presence of these beings and we consider them a problem of some sort or another and the fact that they can look human at times and walk among us, uh, that would be a problem. I've had a number of conversations with witnesses who've had unnerving conversations, um, who've had unnerving interactions, I should say, with beings who are intensely telepathic and um, who are not really going out of the way to communicate with these people, but I think the communication happened kind of accidentally and was a shock to the, uh, to the person. My best guess about these other beings at this point this is my current assessment, is that there are multiple groups watching us right now, interacting with us. I do think that we, humanity, is probably the, I often say that we're the greatest show in this quadrant of the galaxy. And think about our trajectory. We've gone like this for all these years, and suddenly, technologically, we're shooting up like a rocket. In the last 100, 150 years, when you look at the transformation of human society, I think any being who is anyone has, who has the ability to look at us is realizing that we right now are poised to leap right into their world. Whether we will do it successfully, successfully or not is another issue, but I think that we are drawing attention for that reason. Um, they're engaged in surveillance of us. Uh, it is possible, although I don't know for sure, that they are engaged in a preparation of some sort. If I were them, I would probably be interested in preparing for humanity's breakthrough into the next level, and I might be interested in exercising some control over that infrastructure. If I were to think that humanity is particularly violent, particularly warlike, uh, particularly benighted in one way or another, I might want to put my people in uh, positions of power within that society. And similarly, if I'm not necessarily a nice extraterrestrial or alien, and I'm interested in um, manipulation and control, and I think we must consider those possibilities, I think that, frankly, we are fools if we only consider the fact that these other beings are all from the Galactic Federation of Light, if such a thing exists, uh, or that they are all here to help us. I think it is entirely possible that there are such beings as intergalactic economic hitmen, just like we have on Earth. I don't see any reason why that is not a possibility, none whatsoever. And that is despite any messages, by the way, that they may give certain people what people believe they're getting. Uh, manipulating uh, native species would not really be a difficult thing to do, it seems to me. Uh, I do think that they have an interest in our technology. Uh, sightings over the many nuclear installations certainly, I think, attests to that. Um, I think they probably have an interest in this world. We do have an amazing planet with an incredible variety of uh, genetic material. Um, sure, I'm guessing that there are many other planets that have life, but let's assume that Earth is not simply, um, you know, planets like ours are not a dime a dozen. I have to think that Earth is a beautiful place to them as well as to us. So they're interested in Earth. And I think that they must be interested in us. I think that human beings are fascinating. It's not simply that we are kind of intelligent. It's that 
we have certain creativity, we have a certain drive, we have emotions, which might be very, very interesting to them. We have, um, many have argued that uh, it is our spirituality that they are interested in. This is possible, totally possible. There's a lot of reasons they might be interested in us. And they might also be interested in us just because we might become a real major pain in the ass to them in another, let's say, century or so, or less, depending on developments of things like art, advanced artificial intelligence, strong AI, in other words, advanced nanotech, uh, advanced quantum computing, just for starters, and then total manipulation of the human genome and other genomes. In other words, we are reinventing our entire civilization right now and uh, giving ourselves capabilities that our parents and our grandparents could not have dreamed of uh, and that we probably would have a hard time dreaming of even 20 years ago. But it's here and it's coming now. So let me give you an overview of the probable scenario and then I'm going to move ahead into the structure of secrecy as I see it and then possible outcomes of that secrecy. A, retrievals of exotic, that is, uh, alien bodies and technology, significant classified engagements, we're requiring the necessity for absolute secrecy on their part, in their opinion. This is not something that the powers that be would feel they can just talk about, all right? It requires, in their opinion, control over the media, control over academia, control over science. If you think that's impossible, think again, it's not impossible been a lot of work done on exactly how that control is exerted. I'll bypass that for now. Required the creation of black budgets. That is a kind of illegal, quasi-legal, but mostly illegal way of providing funding for these programs so that you don't have to tell Congress about it and you don't have to tell the public about it because you need to keep it secret. So it's black. And uh, that, is, that is not what the American system was supposed to be about. But that's what's happened. It required the creation, I think, or at least the expansion of illegal financing, criminal financing. So we're talking narco-trafficking, uh, banking fraud, securities fraud, not all of which goes into financing the UFO cover-up, but I think some of which probably does, all right, and some of which lines their pockets and, and the like. But uh, the criminal financial system that is in this world is a runaway type of a system. And... Um, and it makes it very easy, I think, to fund these programs when you don't have to go to Congress for uh, tax dollars. You can just get them from, from uh, proceeds from drug trafficking and the like. Um, so this creates a situation of runaway secrecy, and it's a secrecy that becomes privatized. This is another important point about the secrecy. Um, we can't really talk, I think, properly about government secrecy on UFOs anymore. I don't really think that's quite appropriate. I mean, yes, we need to hold governments accountable for this, but what has happened over the last human lifetime is that private corporations have moved into this scenario. So like if I'm the army and I've recovered technology at Roswell or bodies at Roswell, what, what do I do with it? Um, I have some pretty good people within the army who might be able to study it, but ultimately I need to go to my military contractors who have the engineers and the manufacturing capability to try to reproduce this. So ultimately the technology is going to go to private contractors, to major industry. And what happens when that occurs? Uh, presumably the lawyers hammer out a classified agreement giving maybe some ownership to, uh, to General Dynamics or Raytheon or Lockheed or General Electric, some to the Army. Patents that are probably derived from the breakthrough technology go to those companies. They're making a lot of money now, and the, sec the incentive for giving up the secret once you're making a lot of money goes to less than zero. So you have a privatized kind of system that comes into place, and what are they working on? They're working on secret technology programs. They're obviously working to duplicate to some extent this technology, and I think, by the way, they have succeeded to some extent. I think some of the private, uh, excuse me, the black triangles that we're seeing are made by us, um, I've had a, had a very detailed conversation uh, less than a year ago with a, a retired um, engineer from Boeing who told me um, in some detail about the technological capabilities of these black triangles, which Boeing makes. There may be other companies that make it, but Boeing's involved. And these triangles, uh, at least according to my source and 
his information is a little more than 10, 15 years out of date now since he retired, but he was very much on top of it in the 1980s and 90s. And even then, those triangles were very difficult for our pilots to control, apparently. And they were interacting in ways um, that they didn't quite understand with space and time. So the impression that I got from this source is that uh, the technology is, was not totally mastered by us at that time. Okay, um, now another part of the secret technology program I, I have to emphasize is weaponizing it. All right, we're not dealing in a world of really nice people. We're dealing in a world in which militaries and military agencies have obtained dominant control over the technology and over the, um, the science connected with this phenomenon. At least that's my opinion. And if you've got militaries dominating this, you know what they're going to want to do. They go, they'll want to create weapons out of the UFO technology. And I'm thinking of things like extra low frequency weapons, that is ELF, I'm thinking of electromagnetic frequencies, I'm thinking of even things like um, propulsion and, and uh, technologies like mind control. All right, keeping in mind that the mental aspect, the telepathic aspect of this phenomenon has been known to military people since the 1950s. This is actually in uh, declassified documents. All right. And so if you've got a telepathic component to this, do you honestly think that they're not going to want to try to use that as a weapon as well? Of course they will. And I think that's what they have been working on. A lot of these types of technologies, I think, is what they've been working on. So all of this creates what I, I see as a two-class global system. The two classes basically are those tiny groups of people who are in the know and the vast numbers of the rest of us who are not in the know. Uh, within that, what I might call a, um, a br the breakaway civilization. So that this classified world, you think about this, they have access to this radical technology which must never be uh, released to the public in, the, in their opinion. But they continue to work on it and have breakthroughs and ideas, including, let us say, propulsion technology breakthroughs, including, let us say, energy generation breakthroughs, including um, certain types of weapons, including uh, computing breakthroughs, as a matter of fact. Uh, I think that uh, the classified world is decades ahead of the rest of us in this, and it's totally possible that some of that lead came from the study of this technology. Um, allowing this classified world to be so far advanced from the rest of us that they really can be considered a separate civilization, hence a breakaway civilization. And what is this breakaway civilization doing? Well, what I believe they're doing is they are desperately trying to catch up to these other beings that they are perceiving. That's what I think. So in the classified world, if we are ever able to get access to a classified history of this phenomenon, one of my guesses is that we're going to read about the attempt of these people within the breakaway civilization to try to catch up to the so-called aliens and needing to hide that fact from the rest of the world. That doesn't make them heroes, by the way. That just makes them doing what they're doing and sub in the process really subverting our own civilization. Why? through foisting lie upon lie on the rest of us, saying there's nothing to this, um, giving us this kind of strong cognitive dissonance, taking the truth away from the public, uh, taking the uh, democratic, republican-based system of government away from people, because this is a very important issue that people have no control over. And they are well aware of the illegal implications of what they have been doing, all right? hiding breakthroughs in energy, hiding breakthroughs in propulsion, and so much more. And what they are terrified of are two things. They are terrified of disclosure. Uh, personally, they're terrified, let's say, of criminal charges that will be brought against them. I had an email conversation with a gentleman who I believe was part of that organization, and he was very, very clear and very straightforward with me about the fear that they all have uh, the old CYA rule, if, if this comes out, they're afraid of going to prison. And they don't really have any incentive for cooperating. That's one thing. The other thing I think that they're terrified 
um, and this is probably the leadership primarily, is the global transformation that would occur and will occur after disclosure. I wrote a whole book about this called AD After Disclosure. My conclusion is that the end of secrecy on this subject would be beyond revolutionary. It would be the single most dramatic transformation in human civilization. And uh, that, would, that would involve every facet of our society from the politics to science to technology to spirituality to culture to our very view of, of what we are. And none of that even deals with who these other beings are. It's a whole other issue. Now, the question of disclosure. Um, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm very good friends and colleagues with a number of people who are active in the disclosure movement, let us say. Um, I've always been very skeptical that disclosure is going to happen in the immediate future. I do believe it will happen. I think it's an inevitability. But one of the things that I notice when people talk about it is they go on this assumption that we're kind of working with a democratic political system. That is, we're going to go to Congress, we're going to have them talk about UFOs and get this information out there. All of it is predicated on the fact that we have some kind of representative system that, yeah, it's kind of broken, but we can make it work again. I don't really think that's our system anymore. I think that's gone. All right. Disclosure is a totally different animal if you've got a democratic system or if you have a fascist system. And what, what we really don't ask ourselves often enough in our lives is what is our actual political system today? Democracy? Is it a, a republic? I don't really think so. Um, I don't really think we have proper terminology for it, actually. I often refer to it as an oligarchy. I think that's probably it. I think a corporate slash financial oligarchy is um, a good way to look at it. But even that's kind of vague. We don't really have a good name for it. It is something that is creeping further and further into what we would all call, uh, know, uh, call fascism. But I think this whole thing goes by degrees. So I don't think it's all, all fascism and all freedom or anything like that. I believe we're on a, a spectrum. But uh, we're edging closer and closer toward a non-free fascist system. So let me ask, how does this cover-up work? Because this is a phenomenon that is global. It's not simply in the United States. I always laugh when I uh, come across remarks by uh, clearly ignorant skeptics who say, well, why does this, this is obviously, uh, why is this only being reported in the United States? Well, that, that's untrue. UFOs are not reported in the United States solely. They're reported everywhere, absolutely everywhere. So how is it, though, that other nations haven't disclosed the truth on this? It's a reasonable question to ask. What I would say to you uh, in answer to that is that we have a system of international collaboration dominated by the United States military, not solely by the U.S. military, but primarily toward the creation of a global system. But why would nations remain silent? I think the answer is a few reasons. One is bribery. Bribery among national leaders internationally is endemic. This is something that is never discussed in the establishment media, but it is the rule. Um, and it is bribery by the United States slash IMF slash uh, EU slash NATO groups over their, um, over their little vassal states. So bribery. In other words, surveillance, blackmail, threats. We learned all about this explicitly through the Edward Snowden revelations. This is endemic as well. So if you were the president of some nation and you were going to say, screw it, I'm going to disclose the reality of UFOs. I don't care what the United States says. Well, you'd better be very careful because the NSA is monitoring every single phone call you make. They're monitoring your office. They're monitoring all of your cabinet, all of your ministers. How are you going to do this without them knowing? And how are you going to make a plan to do this without them either killing you or destroying you politically? This is very serious high stakes, and I believe that's exactly what's going on. Nations of the world are not independent. They are vassals of a global financial system, which the NSA and the United States military are the primary police force. That's how it works. All right. A couple of other reasons why they remain silent. I think there's basically fear, fear of the unknown, fear of what would happen if they were to let this out. Now we're talking even Russia, even China. Russia and China are not part of the U.S.-dominated system totally. All right? They might have their own reasons for going their own way, right? We might think so. I don't know about that, however. In Russia's case, their economy, just as the United States economy, is dominated by oil. 
even more so, oil exports. If they do a disclosure of the UFO reality, how long do we think it's going to take before people realize these flying saucers, or whatever they are, are not using petroleum to get around from point A to point B? Clearly not. So clearly, this is an economic upheaval for the entire world. And global leaders must be aware of this. Right? And I think ultimately there's probably, I'm, this is my suspicions, my guess, a sense of powerlessness in the face of this overwhelming reality. Um, I wrote about a, a account that came to me about former President Jimmy Carter, and I believe this is a true story about his own uh, time in 1977 when he was briefed on the matter of extraterrestrials and UFOs. <clears throat> it was not known to my source what was said specifically to Carter, but it was known to my source that at the end of the briefing, Carter was sobbing at his desk. And I believe that is true. So how do they keep the silence? Well, I hinted at this earlier. Media control, basically killing off uh, the death of formal journalism. That doesn't really exist anymore in this world, not very much. We do have an alternative media. We have webinars and or things like what we're doing here tonight, and they are helpful, but Usually, they don't have much insider access to, to what's going on. Uh, occasionally, we get leaks, and that's helpful. So therefore, I want to talk about the goals of our handlers. And I'm hoping I can have a little more than 10 minutes to, uh, to do this, because I figure if I started 10 minutes late, I'm going to go 10 minutes late. If there's a problem, uh, let me know. Um, with the knowledge that there is the presence of these others that are here, that are certainly, at least to some extent, interacting with some of the people on this planet that are interested in us, that are, have their own agenda. You have these human elite, and you've got these other beings, and these human elites, they are aware of what's going on. For them, however, the UFO secret, we have to understand this, it's only part of the larger picture for them. The UFO secret is not the only important thing for them. What do these people want? They want ownership over the planet and all the resources, all the water, all the minerals under the ground, all the genetically modified foods that they want to shove down your throat. That's one thing they want to do. Two, they're in competition with each other. That is, you've got a group of elites, and they're duking it out right now. They are trying to create a new political paradigm. We're talking new world order, but beyond new world order, basically a global fascist police state, and we're seeing it happen. They also know that the stuff is going to hit the fan, probably. In other words, that this knowledge, that this reality, rather, is, cannot be held secret forever. Can't. Nothing can happen. Nothing can last forever. And this secret is going to go down. So with that in mind, I think what they are trying to do right now is ramp up and speed up their attempt to control the entire global population so that when, if there is going to be a disclosure, they want complete, total control over the situation, complete, total control over the spin so that people are zombified enough and brain dead enough that they're not really going to be asking the questions and that they don't have the ability to ask the really difficult questions. Right now, we still do. My belief is that they're moving very rapidly, trying their best to move towards a situation of a complete global surveillance state, global control. As one of my uh, colleagues uh, put it, the extraterrestrial question is the secret sauce that flavors the bad meal known as geopolitics. And I think that's about right. All right, because there's a lot of things that are going on here, including, of course, access to that secret technology that they and only they want. So our handlers, our human elites, let's call them that, they have a couple of problems. One problem is social awareness that we have sparked by the web, sparked by our ability to interact with each other just like we're doing tonight and just like we do every single day. Their solution to that problem is to control the web, and that's what they're doing. They're creating all kinds of laws around the world to monitor and restrict and control the web. We're all aware of this. So we're dealing with a race, a foot race between the people and freedom of the people or total control. That's what our world is. So therefore, before any kind of disclosure, these groups are trying to formalize this new structure, the new breakaway financial structure. I call it a breakaway structure. That is not bound by any nation. We're talking, you know, back in the old days of NAFTA and GATT. Now we're talking TPPA and the Transatlantic Free Trade Agreement, all of these things that are now coming into place that take nations out of the picture. 
and to create a transnational corporate fascist police state. That is what they're trying to do right now, and they're doing a damn good job at getting it underway. And that means not just Obama, he's doing it, not just Bush before him, Clinton before him, Bush before him. This is going a long way. It goes across the party. All right? The end of nations as we know it, replacing national governments with basically a corporate structure. And that this means new, basically the new lords, the new royalties. Uh, and we are the new serfs, at least what they want. Um, now, there is, there's rivalries. These rivalries include Russia, they include China, primarily those two nations, which has resulted in an undeclared war by the United States against those two nations. And that's really what we're seeing. I'll come back to that in a moment. The world that they're trying to create, though, no free file sharing. They want to enforce with, uh, intellectual property rights to such an extent that things like the Pirate Bay are going to go down. That's a problem for us because the Pirate Bay and its successors are, will be absolutely critical for us. Why? Think about technology sharing. Think about uh, 3D printing. 3D printing is going to remake this world in ways that people still do not totally quite grasp. Think about free energy. If some smart person on the other side of the world comes up with a free energy device, and by the way, there are a lot of brilliant people working on these, and they decide to be a nice person about it, and they upload the CAD design of that to the future version of the Pirate Bay, and you, with your next generation 3D printer, download it and create a free energy device, you can go off the grid. Goodbye utility companies. That would be nice. That would be a fantastic thing. That is absolutely what the powers that be will not allow us to have. They will do everything possible to prevent this. The question is, will they succeed? Okay. Something like free energy devices, 3D printed free energy is not fantasy. It really could happen. And that would be enough, I think, by itself to break the control over our world. It really would. But what they're creating is a total surveillance and intimidation state, a police state. They want to turn the web, by the way, into television. Um, increasingly, you're seeing the web basically being channeled into, uh, you know, little corporate controlled uh, avenues, whether it's Facebook, whether it's Netflix, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, History Channel Online, Wall Street Journal Online. They're trying to, like, create a TV type system for your computer. And they might just succeed if we're not careful about it. Uh, it's a world that also requires, from their point of view, a creation of continuous false flag events. The new book that I'm working on right now is a history of false flag operations. I'm taking a moment out of UFO research to do this. I feel it's important. I feel that we live in an era of false flags right now specifically for this reason. The reason being they have got to emotionally engage people around the world, particularly those who believe that they're in democratic societies, to get them on board with the latest thing that they got to scare the hell out of you with. So whether it was from 9-11 or the fictitious weapons of mass destruction in Iraq or the 7-7 bombing in London or, uh, you know, the new vaccines that you're supposed to be taking due to the next flu virus that's coming your way or um, the Boston bombing or the creation of ISIS, which I also argue is a flat, false flag. All of these creations by, uh, by a global elite system dominated by the United States military to scare the hell out of people, to corral them into a certain direction for control. This will continue until they have maintained total control over global intellectual and social life, and they are working at it. I think they're also working ultimately on some version of class-based transhumanism. That's a scary thought. What that means is basically a master race. Hitler's dream of the 1930s can be achieved by these people. Absolutely can be. When they've got genetic breakthroughs uh, that might allow them to slow down or even stop the aging process, will that be available for everyone? Disease-free, will that be available for everyone? Super intelligence, super strength, will those be available for everyone? There's a real question about that. It might be available for those who can afford it. And if that is the case, we're really gonna be moving into a truly dystopian nightmare, all right? All of these things are on their agenda. And then there's the development of the breakaway technology, in part UFO-derived. And then we might 
try to imagine what is their end game vis-a-vis -vis these other beings. You know, I think that what they're trying to do is to play catch up, as I said before, but I believe that their version of catch up will only include a hierarchical totalitarian state. That's how I believe that they, they think they're going to do catch up. That's going to leave most people out of that out of that game. Only then, after they've achieved that, would there be a voluntary disclosure of sorts. In other words, they want to achieve disclosure as only after they've achieved a 24-7, all-encompassing, virtual fascist society. That's their goal. So, now the fly in the ointment is this. I talked about the current undeclared war that's going on. This is really between the U.S. and Russia. Anyone who's looked into this at all can see this is what's happening. The United States has created a, a series of false flags against Russia. They are trying to destroy Russia economically. This might be a gambit that fails. It is, in totally, uh, it is totally possible that the gambit will fail. And it could be, um, as the kids these days say, an epic fail that could result in the collapse of the dollar. Why? The United States dollar, and this is, I can't really give a whole lecture on the, on the petrodollar and what it signifies, but this is worth your looking into. Essentially, the U.S. dollar is supported on one and only one thing, on the use of U.S. military force to force nations into buying their oil by using dollars. That is the petrodollar, and this has been going since the 1970s, and it has supported the U.S. dollar. It has allowed the United States government to just crank out and print out trillions of dollars that no other nation could afford to do. But the U.S. can do it because they know they got the entire world, excuse my French here, but by the balls, because they know that every other nation needs dollars to buy oil, and they don't really care if, uh, if there's excess of dollars out there because they are forcing militarily all the Middle Eastern nations to maintain the petrodollar system. And the U.S. is also, along the same lines, trying to control every single natural gas and oil field that they can possibly control, and they're doing a pretty good job of that. They can't ever be open and honest about this. That's why they have to lie. So that's the petrodollar system. If that ever pops, that is, in other words, if oil ever goes away, or at least as a source of energy, or if... Um, other nations are able to buy their oil in other currencies. We're going to see in the United States a very probable hyperinflation that would collapse the economy and end America's run as the global hegemonic power. Still, however, retaining the world's scariest military industrial complex. Let's not forget that. So we're, we're potentially dealing with a real catastrophic global situation that's going on right now. Um, I'm not usually one to talk about uh, doom and gloom here. Um, I mean, I have a lot of friends who do that with me all the time. But this is the first time when I look at the global political and financial scenario that I'm getting a little worried myself. All right. Um, now, this coming global meltdown could go two different ways. It could be the opportunity to initiate a disclosure, and I say the disclosure about the UFO reality. I say this because in my own study of political crises of the 20th century, of the later 20th century, in a number of cases internationally, pardon me, um, political crises have resulted <clears throat> in opening of different types of information, including UFO-related information, and that might just happen in the United States. Um, it could be also, on the other hand, an opportunity for a uh, diversion, another diversion from disclosure. Um, nothing is really sure here. But meanwhile, there's some serious clandestine activity going on. I don't know if anyone, uh, probably many of you are familiar with the statement from Dmitry Medvedev, Prime Minister of Russia. He was a number two man next to Putin in Russia, still is. At the end of... Uh, in December of 2012, December 7th, Medvedev was on a television in doing an interview and thought he was off camera. Someone, um, I don't know what the question was, but he started talking about ETs. And he, and he stated that uh, the president of the country of Russia is given two briefcases. One has all the nuclear codes and one has a special uh, folder which contains all the information about aliens who visited our planet. This is 
This is a direct quote in Russian. Um, he said, along with this, you are given a report of the absolutely secret special service that exercises control over aliens on the territory of our country. He was totally straight faced. The woman interviewing him, I think, was uh, probably was nervous. I don't. That's why she laughed, perhaps. I don't know why. She did laugh. Maybe she thought he was joking. He didn't look like he was joking. Then he said something that a lot of Western analysts interpreted as confirming it was a joke. I don't think so. He says, more detailed information on this topic you can get from a well-known movie called Men in Black. That's how it was translated. The true translation of it, as I understand it, is that you can receive more detailed information having watched the documentary film Men in Black. Not the Hollywood movie Men in Black, which is what everyone assumed. There is a Russian documentary, a serious treatment of this, called Men in Black. I think it is very likely that that is what Dmitry Medvedev was talking about. So my question is, and I guess I'll be getting close to wrap up here, and I can hopefully answer some of your questions. And I hope you've been enjoying this, by the way. How do we get past the lies and openly discuss the truth? That is the question. I think one thing we can do is support groups that leak information. I'm talking groups like WikiLeaks. Um, you know, the fact that they are uh, um, considered illegal by many nations of the world is irrelevant. And I think I have to say this, should not dissuade us from supporting them. They are doing work that we really need. Around the world, we're in a situation where this the noose around our freedom's neck is getting tighter and tighter, and we've got to take measures to deal with that. I think also we need to support good UFO research. I'm talking solid research that's going to make a public impact. I think we need to use critical thinking. I think we need to opt out of the system when feasible. I'm talking things like homeschooling. I homeschooled my kids. I'm very proud of that. I strongly recommend it. Anything to try to inculcate independence from the system in any way that's possible, primarily in our mind. We need to engage in focused and pragmatic citizen action. We need to inspire other people. And we need to be aware of all the new tools that are constantly on the way for us to communicate with each other, for us to work and collaborate. We can't just do this on our own. We have to work with each other. Um, one question I ask myself is, are we really ready for open contact with these other beings. Um, you know, I, I really do wonder about this frequently, and my my go-to position is that we're really never going to be ready. Um, I, I'm sure some of you listening will might disagree with me, and that's fine. And maybe you're right. Um, maybe you're not right, though. Um, because when you really, when I at least look at all of the ramifications of the presence of these other beings here, I keep coming back to the fact that their capabilities vastly, vastly are outstripping our own. And although there may be uh, entities that are trying to guide us into a peaceful future, um, I think that there are, I don't think that they're the only ones in, in the game here. And for whatever reason, um, none of them are really making open contact. And, I, and this is why I think so. Um, I, I play a little mind, um, little mind exercise with myself sometimes of going back in time. So let us say that we, some of us, were to go back only a mere 1,000 years into the human past. That's not really long ago, and we're going to be dealing with human beings who are exactly like us just a thousand years ago. So the question is, how much about our society today in 2015 could we tell them? Could we tell the most brilliant medieval person that we encounter from the year 1015? Would we be able to tell them even that the, uh, that the earth goes around the sun? Uh, maybe not. That might be a tough one. That might be enough to pop someone's head. Uh, could we tell them furthermore about things like bacteria and microbes and microscopic organisms? Could we tell them about, um, you know, the possible age of the earth? Could we tell them about, um, you know, the size of the earth? And then could we tell them about all of the other uh, things in physics, the concepts that we deal with in our world today? 
Could we tell them about? Uh, I mean, what if could we tell them about the, the tools and our iPads and our weapons? I mean, what would that do to those people? I mean, I, th I really think that they would have a kind of a psychological, social meltdown if the information that we had in our society were to be given to them. And that's that's human beings exactly like us, a mere 1,000 years distant from us. That's nothing. So what would it be like for other beings who probably operate beyond our space-time reality? How much could they actually tell us about the nature of their reality, even if they had our best interests in mind? My suspicion is very little, very little indeed. And that's if they had our best interests in mind. What if they didn't really care about us that much the way some of us like to think they do? What if they really don't? What if they use us or want to use us? How much truth would we get out of them then? Would we get truth or would we get uh, deception from them just like we get deception from our own elites? All of these are questions I really can't answer, but I'm just putting them out there for your um, uh, for you to think about. So all of these let me – now, the fact that we're never going to be ready for disclosure doesn't mean it's not going to happen. All right. My opinion is that our desires are of really secondary importance to the fact that we, my friends, are on a train. And that train is going down a track. And it's going at a very high speed right now. We have reinvented our civilization, and we are continuing to reinvent this civilization in ways that I am convinced are going to force this secret out one way or another. I don't know exactly how that mechanism is going to happen, but I think it's going to happen. And, um, and we're not going to be ready for it, but um, it will happen. And when it happens… This civilization we have that is really built on encrusted lie after lie after lie is going to have a serious crisis. And this could be a crisis that will ultimately be a, a, very, um, a very positive outcome. But I think it may take a few generations for that outcome to be seen. I think in the meantime, we're going to be dealing with a lot of confused and angry and frightened people who, uh, you know, not everyone is going to be ready for the portal to ascension, you know. So there's going to be a lot of other people of very, very uh, differing levels of understanding of this, and they're going to be inhabiting this earth along with the rest of us. So it's going to take time, but I think ultimately once we – get this reality out, whatever it entails. I, I do have a faith and I do believe that we're, we will be better off for it because I cannot believe that uh, we are meant to live in a world based on illusions and lies that are designed to manipulate us and keep us in the dark. I cannot believe that and I'll never believe that. No matter how difficult the truth may be, maybe it's a wonderful thing, but whatever the truth is, I think that we are better off knowing it than not knowing it. And with that, I want to thank you for uh, being here with me. And I've got some time to uh, answer some questions. If we've got to see some lots of uh, uh, comments in the chat room here. So um, I don't know what's the uh, – someone says thank you so much. You're quite welcome. I'm very glad to do this. Um, should I um, – maybe Neil or Peter can uh, tell me if I should simply scroll up the, uh, the chat. And yeah, we have a question right, question right here. Let me see. Sure, do you want to just tell me what they are? Sure. Or or should I just read it? My my I need a new prescription here. Can you read the Can one read by the Aiden one Dean, by Dean, Dean right, at the top? right at the top? At the very, very top? I gotta to scroll all the way up to the top here? No, just just no, at the top of the existing window. It says hi Richard, the UFO subject, subject seems, seems to represent a spectrum. You see that oh, right there? Yes, I see it right here, yeah. Okay, uh, the UFO subject seems to represent a spectrum, for example, sightings lasting seconds to hours. Some people never get physical encounters while others are taken aboard. This suggests a lack of unification on their part. Yeah, given the differences in encounter types, yet all of them abide by a single principle of non-mass intervention. Oops, I just lost it. Um, what do you make of this? Yeah, I, I actually wonder about this a lot. That's a great question, and uh, it's one reason that I, I'm – hypothesizing, I'm not the only one to do this, that we're dealing with multiple groups um, that act in different ways. I mean, 
you've got people who describe the classic tiny, large-headed gray aliens. That's one type. You have people who talk about uh, totally human Nordic type beings, and I get this more and more. You get people who talk about um, telepathic downloads of benign entities that uh, is a completely non-physical encounter altogether. Now those types of encounters I have a hard time with. I'm not saying that they don't happen, but I have a hard time with them because they're not associated typically with UFOs. They are associated with uh, intentional contact that people are adamant saying that yes, they, they got when they meditated, when they did it. And I, I don't disbelieve them by the way. Um, but what I don't really know is what exactly they're dealing with. Um, but yeah, there's a plethora, there's a wide variety of types of encounters here. I mean, ultimately, I, I'll, um, I'll just speak off the record, even though I'm, I guess this is on the record. My sense of what we're dealing with is I don't, I actually don't think that we are ever really going to get truly to the bottom of this mystery. That doesn't mean we shouldn't attempt. I, I spent my life doing it, and I'm glad I have. What I mean is, if we, this, this is a true story that happened to me when I was very, very young. I was observing my dog. I think I was about 20 years old or so. And um, I was feeding my dog, and I was observing my dog as I was feeding him. And I realized, well, my dog's very smart, you know. He knows me. He uh, knows that there's food in that can as I was opening up the can of dog food. He was very aware of that. And um, and he knows, knows a lot of things that I, I will was never aware of, like smells and sounds and so forth. But he didn't know how the food got into that can. Like, you could, couldn't figure that out. He didn't know that we have factories that make dog food, right? He doesn't know that he was taken out of his natural environment to live in cities with human beings, and he doesn't know what the moon is when he howls at it. It's not that he doesn't know. He can't know because he's a dog. Dogs' brains work a certain way. Our brains work a certain way. And I remember thinking, well, gee, Richard, you're so damn smart. So your, your dog's here. You're here. What's there? What's up there? In other words, there have to be beings with the ability to, to, to sense dimensions of reality beyond anything that we can, we can grasp. Now, I do think that we have abilities to grasp glimpses of that through, um, you know, I'm a very big believer in things like remote viewing and clairvoyance. I don't need any more convincing about that. I am convinced. So we've all got a capability there. But <clears throat> that's a capability. But what about these other beings? My hunch is that they're on orders of magnitude beyond us. They very probably have abilities to manipulate space-time reality in, in ways that we can really only dream of right now or, and, and dream of comprehending. It would be like if we go into a, a fish pond and there's fish in there, and they can perceive that we're there, but they, they don't really know what we do on land. So we're a little bit more advanced than the fish, but you get my point. So um, it's not that we can't make progress in understanding that we can. But, uh, and I, I believe, by the way, that this phenomenon is a true spark and a spur to human development in our own understanding of not just science, but the science of consciousness. I really believe that this subject is, a, is an important trigger um, toward promoting that. But whether we'll ever really get to the full understanding of this, um, I'm, I'm a bit, I, I don't really, I don't really think that's ever going to happen. Someone down at the bottom here says, do I know if John Podesta is still actively involved in disclosure? Can you comment on his Twitter comment before he resigned from Obama's uh, staff? He's one of the rare few of the White House to speak out. Yeah, so uh, John Podesta, very close to the Clintons. He was Clinton's chief of staff back in the day. Uh, was Obama's transition team chief when Obama was elected president and has been close with uh, Obama and is close with Hillary, by the way. Uh, so at the end of 2014, had a Twitter, like a New Year's type of Twitter thing, and, and his number one Twitter, uh, his number one regret, he said, was of the lack of disclosure on UFOs. Hell of a thing for such a guy to say. There's been a lot of speculation as to why Podesta has said this, also as to, relatedly, why President Obama went on Jimmy Kimmel to talk about UFOs, which he did, and a year before him, Bill Clinton did the same thing on Jimmy Kimmel. What's going on there? 
you know, when, when you do something like Jimmy Kimmel and you're the president, I can tell you right now, none of that is spontaneous. All right. All of it is scripted and all of it comes from the White House. The White House wanted that to come up. And the question is, why? Why do it? I think, you know, in Podesta's case, I don't trust the statements coming from John Podesta. Now, I've never met him. I would like to meet him. I'd like to have a heart to heart with him. I don't know if I'll ever have the chance. But I think that we're looking at, maybe we're looking at a good cop, bad cop type of thing. So Podesta is talking about disclosure, knowing, I'm assuming, that it will never voluntarily come. I mean, I don't think he's, he's a fool, so he must know that disclosure would be a very, very disruptive thing for any White House. But the Presidents Obama and Clinton, I think, did the real, uh, the real work on this by, by turning it into a big joke. Uh, particularly Barack Obama, if you watch him on Kimmel, the whole thing, Jimmy Kimmel says, well, if, you know, if I were president, I'd be looking into the UFO secrets, et cetera, et cetera. And Obama says, well, we can't because they control us. You know, big joke. Ha, ha, ha. Well, the reality of that is that um, Obama is controlled. <laughs> and anyone who studies the presidency knows that they're totally controlled. But I think they were using humor to disable this. And um, Here's a question about Stephen Greer. Someone says, uh, I, do Stephen Greer's CE5 protocols actually work? One person adds, I use them and they do work. Um, yeah, I mean, here's the thing. Um, I've never paid the uh, whatever $5,000 fee, whatever it is, to pay Stephen Greer so that I could participate in his protocols. Uh, I'm just not going to do that. Now, I have been present at a few of them. I've done conferences with Stephen Greer, and I've... Um, uh, contact in the desert at Joshua Tree. I was there a year ago with him, and uh, I stayed out while he was vectoring in a uh, craft that he claimed to have seen. I didn't see a thing. I saw not one thing. Uh, there were other people who said, oh, yes, I see a craft. Well, uh, I didn't see anything that made me think that is a UFO. I've also looked at YouTube videos of CE5 protocols done by Stephen Greer, in which he said that's a craft, that's a spacecraft, and so forth, and which absolutely, when you're looking off the coast of Florida, surrounded by military installations, uh, you got to be very, very careful before you say that that's a UF, uh, an alien craft. And indeed, there were a number of highly informed comments within that YouTube thread that made me persuaded that they were looking at military technology. Having said that, all right, um, I also have a number of colleagues and friends who have instituted those protocols on their own or with small groups and have told me adamantly at times that they had success. Um, I'm not going to discount that. I do think that there are, we have to be very careful though. When we see what we think is a UFO, uh, I think in some of these cases, it's probably not an alien craft, it's probably not an extraterrestrial craft. There's a lot of activity in the sky, particularly if you take night vision glasses and look, I've done this. It's like Grand Central Station up above us, believe it or not, it's, it's insane. Uh, what I think a lot of the times what we're seeing are highly advanced terrestrial breakaway technology. That's my opinion. I do think that we're seeing some non-human technology out there as well. And I am inclined to uh, acknowledge that our own mental focus can have an ability of reaching out to these other beings. But I don't really know how successful that is, how often that really happens. So uh, that's my very – trying to be nuanced here about it. I'm looking at another one from Ryan. Why does Russia care about oil? <laughs> Once we have free energy, Russia will be able to thrive as a nation without oil. Well, yeah, that's – the reason that doesn't make sense is because it's a logical question, Ryan. I mean, yes. Uh, you're, you're thinking in terms of the benefit of humanity. But you have to, we have to remember that Russia, just like America, is dominated by a power structure. All right, It's dominated by people. What are they in love with? They're in love with power. They're in love with being at the top of the human hierarchy. All right? And on that basis, and, and not only that, all right, 
in the long term, yes, humanity needs to get off of oil. Uh, I think we all know this. All right, oil is not going to take us to where we need to be as a species. But the problem is that in the short term, I'm talking within 20, for at least 20 years or longer, disclosure is going to be a goddamn mess for the entire world. And it's going to be a huge mess for Russia. You're going to have to deal with the complete recreation of a global financial system. We're not just going to go like off of money and off of oil all at once. There has to be a transition, and it's going to be very difficult. There's also going to be a lot of people going to jail um, due to the secrecy. And uh, I assume that there'll be a number of Russians as well as a number of Americans and other national uh, leaders that are going to be culpable. And I just I can't see that they have any motivation for giving this up unless we get down to like a desperate gambit if the United States is really squeezing Russia and really threatening uh, to succeed in instituting regime change, turning Russia into a vassal state, which they really want to do. Um, maybe then. Maybe something like that will happen then. Um, we're probably getting close to wrapping up. Someone else here writes, Phil says, thanks for, oh wow, thank you. Thanks for all your credible work, Richard. Thank you, Phil. For that. That's a nice thing to say. Do you have any thoughts on the Pope's encyclical and the coming showdown with transnational corporations as discussed by Danny Sheehan. Does it intersect with disclosure? Wow, you're keeping on top of this. So I was with Danny uh, just a couple of months ago in Joshua Tree where he talked about the coming papal encyclical, which um, was going to deal, someone says answer the Vatican question. What the hell is the Vatican? Oh, do I think the Vatican will have a role? Okay, all right, one thing at a time. Um, I'm waiting for this. Danny talked about this jubilee year that the Pope's going to institute that will be uh, um, a worldwide cancellation of debt if nations do not get on board with uh, carbon taxing and uh, fighting global warming. I thought that's a pretty odd uh, position for the Pope to get involved in, frankly. But um, I haven't heard much about that except that uh, the Pope is talking about um, global warming and carbon tax. I haven't heard any talk about a jubilee year. Uh, disclosure. Um, I haven't heard Danny talk about that from, coming from the Vatican in his last uh, statement, unless I missed it. Um, larger question is, that will the Vatican have a role in disclosure? And I, I would say this, that if when we get to a kind of snowball effect, when it seems like disclosure has moved from being impossible to inevitable, guarantee that the Vatican is going to get on board. The Vatican has information. They have a 2,000-year history. They have a lot of um, stake in maintaining themselves as a relevant um, institution in a post-disclosure world. There's no way that they're going to just voluntarily give up uh, the initiative on this. Someone just asked... Um, if I'm interested, the common esoteric teachings amongst multiple ancient cultures was explored and decoded clearly in a very good free ebook. Uh, the Path of the Spiritual Sun by Belzebub. It's like Beelzebub. And Angela Pritchard. I'll look for it. Thank you. Um, oh, and someone says Danny has a link to the Vatican Pope message off of his website. All right, good. Um, how are we doing here with time? I've, I've been having a good time. What are the odds that we get disclosure in the next two years? Someone asked me. Oh, God. You know, I hate these questions. Um, I don't know. I would say um, not, better than 10 to, not better than one against 10. So maybe, maybe up to 10% chance. But let's say within um, – and, and if it happens within the next two years, it'll only be – It'll be as an accident, like it'll be as something accidentally leaking out, like I would, like a WikiLeaks type of event, or like another Edward Snowden, or one of those releases. I think that could do it. I'm, I'm less sure that a mass sighting could do it than five, six years ago when I wrote AD. Um, back then, I was a little more keen on the idea that a mass sighting could do it. I think the leaks, a leak, an unauthorized leak. Could do it. Uh, now, if we're talking the next 20 years, I would bump up the odds uh, to um, maybe 50-50, maybe even money. I think 20 years 
it really could happen. And the reason I think it can happen is because our own technological infrastructure is transforming so rapidly. I, I just have to think it's going to give us a tool that we cannot yet conceive of that will allow us, that will be a game changer. Now, the other side of it, as I was talking about tonight, is that the, the hierarchy might just succeed. I mean, they might succeed in creating this kind of global totalitarianism that I'm so afraid of. I don't, I don't think they're going to succeed, but they might. And if they do, then all bets are off. Uh, okay. Let's see here. Um, someone says, I seem very distrustful of most, if not all, groups trying to push for disclosure. What, do you, what are you doing these days to help bring disclosure if you really should, feel it should happen? Well, first of all, I feel it should happen because I don't believe in uh, people being spoon-fed lies for the rest of their life. And I, look, I support uh, all groups that are trying to bring about disclosure. I'm very close friends with Stephen Bassett over at Paradigm Research Group, and I think I know, in fact, that I'm the only person who's ever spoken at every single one of Stephen's X conferences that he organized over the years. And I've been very close with Stephen on a lot of initiatives. I believe in what he's trying to do, but I've also had a 15-year debate with Stephen over the, in, the immediate uh, inevitability of disclosure. Stephen was telling me back in 01 and 02 that it was right around the corner, and I said, well, I don't think so. He was telling me this in 05 and 06, and I said, well, I don't really think so. And he's been telling me this this year. And I think that disclosure will happen. I just don't think it's going to happen right away. Um, and I also support the idea of trying our best to use the political institutions we have to do it, which is what he tries. As dead as they are, as moribund as they are, they're still ours. They still belong to us. And so... I don't want to give up on that either. I'm just, um, I, I don't want to say distrustful of them. I'm just skeptical that it's going to lead to anything immediately. But no, we have to keep hammering away. Uh, what I'm doing personally, all I can do is my work. I can only do my research and, um, and do my part to try the best I can to bring about uh, logical, intelligent books on the reality of this phenomenon and wake as many people up as I can. That's, that's really... That's my role, I guess. Um, okay. Someone says, Bob Lazar, yay or nay? I say yay. I met Bob Lazar just recently as well. And, uh, but even beyond that, I did uh, a lot of research on Lazar for one of my books. I wrote about him for eight or nine pages. And I am con it's a little warm in here, forgive me. I've got the window closed and my fan off so that it, I, there's no noise pollution here. Anyway, um, I think Lazar's fundamentally telling the truth when he said he worked at S4 and that he worked on uh, an alien craft. There's a lot more I could get into. I don't think he's a total fraud. Well, it's, uh, I'm guessing we're probably um, run out of time here. I've, I've answered all the questions I could answer as best I could. I, I, hope, that, I hope that was good. It was and awesome, Richard. Thank you, so Thank you so much. Oh, it was, it was fun, actually. I'm really glad to do it. And how many people are in the in the uh, chat room right now? Eighty-five. Eighty-five. Hey, awesome. <laughs> is there any is there anyone there who is on as a result of the Facebook post that I put up earlier today? I'm just curious. A couple of yeses. Bunch of yeses. Wow, whole bunch. That's awesome. That's awesome. Good. <laughs> it works. Facebook works. <laughs> Facebook works. Yeah. yeah. So we had, so we had we, 220 yeah, people, signed people signed up. So, right. so within an hour, within an hour everybody's going to get email the link. So, we'll oh, so this is this is going to be this is recorded and you're going to have it available. Yeah. Uh, so, in the future, uh, so, is that it? Uh, exactly. I'll send you the link. You, the link, you can download it, download it and, um, and everybody who um, signed up is an automated system, system that, that as soon as the video is rendered, you'll send it straight to them. So all 220 people will get it. Great. Cool. Uh, someone asked, am I still doing my radio show? Absolutely, I am. It's every Monday night, uh, 8 to 10 Eastern Time on KGRA Radio. If, if you're a Facebook friend of mine, I put updates on that all the time every Monday before the show with a link. So, um, yes, it's called The Richard Dolan Show. Uh, someone says they don't see it on YouTube. Yeah, I, I would like to get it more on YouTube. I did an interview recently with Catherine Austin Fitz, which will be on YouTube, and one I just did last night with David Pilates fascinating researcher that will be on youtube both of those in the near future 
Okay. Um, I guess we're good. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. Thank you, and uh, thanks everyone for being here. Uh, there's a couple of private notes here that I'm supposed to read, not out loud. So, um, yeah, if someone wants to find me on Skype, there's a couple of people who want to talk to me privately. Um, find me on Skype. I'm going to put this out here. I don't uh, search for my email on Skype under new contacts. If you look for Richard Dolan, there's a thousand of them. So look for my email, which is a Gmail account. It's keyholepub at gmail.com. It's all one word, keyholepub at gmail.com. If you, if you type that into Skype, new contacts, uh, you'll get me, and you can, you can ask me a question there if you want. Otherwise, uh, shoot me an email or find me on Facebook. All right, I guess that's it. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you, brother. Have, Have a good night. night. Talk you to you Take care, everybody. Bye. 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 Hello, everybody. And uh, I guess I'll just take it from here. I want to thank the uh, everyone who organized this to bring me on here. This is kind of a nice little thing to do. I'm speaking to you out of my own house in my bedroom. I'm not going to tilt the camera around. We don't need to do that. My bed's partially made. That's all you're going to know. Uh, I'm here to talk about uh, global dimensions of uh, the UFO phenomenon, or however I title it, ET phenomenon. And it, by the way, I'm seeing everyone's chat messages come up. So if you do have an interesting question, uh, you want to chat it in there, and I'll, I'll see it. I should be able to see it. Uh, I'm going to move this over to the side, but I'll still be able to see that. Um, and I'll do my best at answering it if it's kind of in line with things. And I'm seeing all these nice uh, messages, so that's good to see. I appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> I've been researching UFOs a long time, I guess about 20 little more than 20 years and my main focus is really not so much on the spiritual aspects of this phenomenon I think that's interesting I don't discount it but I'm really a political analyst that's fundamentally what I'm interested in doing and looking into and in terms of the UFO phenomenon uh, my interest in general and tonight is really to look at <clears throat> to see how this phenomenon relates to us globally and in terms of the international power structure uh, in other words, you know, have you asked yourself, how does the cover-up operate? Uh, to what extent can we make sense out of this? I don't have every single answer for that, by the way, but uh, I'm going to offer some thoughts about that for you tonight. Someone asked me, do I think the ETs have their own religion? That wasn't really on my agenda, and I have no way of knowing. I mean, what do we even mean by religion? Do they have their own spiritual beliefs? They, my guess is that they have their own spiritual orientation in the sense that they understand um, the nature of their own non-locality. And if they're able to do that, then they have a discipline, and we can call that a religion, since around roughly the same time. I'm not going to go over the whole litany of airspace violations that existed that we know about that happened in the 40s and 50s, but there were many. And we know about them through declassified documents through the Freedom of Information Act. And just to give you like an, a, a feel for what I'm talking about, I mean, just put yourself back in the position of uh, these top generals, these top intelligence officers responsible uh, for United States national security, okay? So you've just completed the Second World War, and which was an absolutely titanic struggle, uh, which left millions of people homeless and millions on the brink of starvation, which left you with the beginnings of this thing called the Cold War and this rivalry with the Soviet Union, Russia, and, um, and with the advent of a new weapon, an atomic bomb, which, which scared the hell out of the world in the sense that there is this weapon now that people realize could destroy human civilization. This is a very, very big thing. So all of this was hanging over them. And on top of that, there is the appearance 
of these, let's call them objects, these things that were cited many times at sensitive uh, installations, nuclear installations primarily over at Los Alamos um, in New Mexico, over at Oak Ridge in uh, Tennessee, over at uh, Hanford, Washington. All of these were critically important nuclear technology installations at the time. Very important. And um, each one of them had reports, had instances of objects being cited. In the case of uh, the Hanford Atomic Energy Commission plant back in 1950, there was a report saying uh, objects round in form have been cited over the plant. These objects reportedly were uh, over 15,000 feet in altitude. Air Force jets attempted interception with negative results. So the Air Force tried to go after these things. And then the memo went on to say that they alerted anti-aircraft battalion, radar units, Air Force fighter squadrons, and the FBI, all for further investigation of just this one incident. All right. Uh, keeping in mind that every incident we know about through freedom of information, there is very strong reason to believe that there are dozens and hundreds and Munyar, which was like their top uh, missile launch facility. An object came in late at night, hovered low over their nuclear weapons, over their missiles, attempted interceptions, all failed. This object was off the charts in maneuverability. The Russian jets had no capability. And we learned about this after... Um, uh, in Glasnost when KGB files briefly were opened up relating to UFOs when the Soviet Union broke apart. And that's how we know about this case. Um, another fascinating case a year later in Moscow. Then in Belgium, the famous Belgian Triangle of 1989-1990. And right on through the years and into our own century, we have a famous attempted interception uh, over near Washington, D.C. in 2002 couple of F-16s completely outclassed. I personally spoke to two of those witnesses. And um, perhaps even more famously in 2008 in Stephenville, Texas, an enormous object seen by witnesses. One of them described it as as big as a Walmart. Flying Walmarts are probably the most frightening thing that I personally can imagine. But the point is that this object had instant acceleration as well. We're talking about things that are just off the charts. I came across a case a few years ago, uh, a Canadian case, the northernmost installation uh, habitation of humans on the planet Earth is at a Canadian military base, very close to the North Pole. It's an electronic listening station, and um, only about 50 personnel are there year-round. And an object there was, uh, was seen hovering low over the base. It uh, appeared to be able to turn off... Uh, uh, excuse me, it turned on a, a spotlight, an intense spotlight beam over the base and then flew off over the frozen Arctic Sea. Um, I spoke at length with one of the witnesses of this case, and I, I think it's a true case. And, um, and it does not appear to either of us that this was any kind of drone technology, any kind of uh, classified military technology. This is really some off the chart stuff. Um, so what I would say on that basis, simply on military encounters, is that our military and other militaries are totally outclassed by technology that comes from elsewhere. Not, there is no evidence that this is ours. Even the, uh, let's call it the Nazi technology thesis, for instance, that we will probably never know about. So in other words, airspace violations alone were a very huge thing. And this went on for years and years, and it wasn't simply an American thing. Uh, it became very clear that militaries around the world, and I'll get to civilians in a minute, but militaries around the world were encountering these as well. By the 1970s, we have very good reports out of China. We have very good reports, um, many from the 1950s onward out of South America, quite a few military ones. Uh, there was one from Chile in 1978 that is mind-blowing. Uh, where you have multiple encounters by Chilean F-5 aircraft with an enormous aerial object which that was on multiple radar returns and gave the return of 10 aircraft carriers, except that this wasn't floating on the water. This was up in the sky. Again, visualize something that could be that large. 
the pilots each had visuals of this object and they described it as absolutely gargantuan and they were they were afraid to approach it uh, and as they were getting a little bit closer to it according to the radar and their eyes the object just instantly took off to the um, west over the Pacific Ocean and was gone just gone so it was not only as large as 10 aircraft carriers, but it had instant acceleration and departure. That's back in 1978. And we have this, this is in a US declassified document um, that we got uh, through Chile. So it's just fascinating. And you have to ask yourself, what, what could that possibly be? Could that possibly be human technology? I think that's very unlikely. Could it possibly be alien? Well, sure. What are they doing in an object that is the size of 10 aircraft carriers? Is that a floating city? That's sure what it seems like to me. And we've had these encounters around the world all through the years. There was a famous case in the United Kingdom in 1980 in England at the Rendlesham Forest, it was very well known of a landed craft. In Russia in the 1980s, a case in a city called Down the Gorse where an object came down and seems to have been recovered by the Russians massive uh, event in Brazil in 1986 and then again in Russia in 1989 at their place called Kapus religion I doubt that it's a religion of received wisdom in the sense that we have religion in from uh, Muhammad or Buddha or, or Jesus or anything like that uh, you know received uh, Bible I, I would be shocked if ETs had anything along those lines I think I'm going to probably not answer too many questions here because they're going to take me far off. But here's another one. How do those nations with space programs keep under wrap the artifacts found on other planets? Okay. I'm going to come, I hopefully we will come to that. I'm going to move some of these chats a little off to the side. I think they're going to distract me. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I'll be able to uh, handle this probably after I'm done with this. How about that? When I look at the uh, UFO phenomenon, when we look at the UFO phenomenon, uh, I think it's very easy to forget that sightings are not only global, they're not only worldwide, <clears throat> but there are so many thousands of encounters, that is direct encounters with what appear to be non-human beings, and on top of that, the thousands upon thousands of uh, perplexing UFO sightings that exist every year. We have no way of knowing how many there are because, frankly, we are at a loss of collecting the data. It's only in North America that we have a couple of websites. There's the MUFON website. There's the National UFO Reporting Center. They collect sites. For 2014, they collected a, a total of, I think, about 14,000 reports last year. 14,000. I'm not saying all of those are alien craft or even that most of them are, but I think uh, they're quite quite interesting. And then when you consider that for every report that there is, there's probably 10 or more that are not reported, it's off the charts. And it's not simply in North America, it is everywhere. Uh, the fact is in other countries they do not have websites, they don't really have an organized systematic way to record this. So. I mean, really, when you think about how massive this phenomenon is and how much of a pittance our global effort to collect data is, it's, it's unbelievable. I mean, I just find that astonishing. But what, what we do know is that this phenomenon has engaged highest levels of American national security since at least the 1940s. It's totally possible that it was even before that, but I think uh, from the early 1940s onward, this has been a thing, and I think it's also been a thing to other nations.